Hi everybody, welcome to the final of the four practices of good helpers. Uh, effective helpers are ones who make it stick. And what I mean by this is they can make help sustainable and resilient until it accomplishes its purpose. You know, sometimes help ends simply because it works. If I go help a neighbor to move into their new house, I've unloaded their truck and that was the task. It's accomplished and there's not much else to worry about there. Um, the, the reality, though, is that we often face problems or we're trying to help in ways that require more sustainable and resilient help. And so what about when help stops too soon and why? And, and this is something we're going to be talking about in this session, how to make help resilient and sustainable. Sometimes help is refused, and that's one of the things that stops help prematurely. People don't want to be helped. For this, there's actually research done on something called a threat model, a self-identity threat model. And, it, and, and multiple studies have dug into what are the reasons that people refuse help from others. And these are the common reasons that show up in the research. First of all, people find that help challenges their freedom and their autonomy, meaning that they feel like they can't truly act in ways that are independent from others. The second one is help implies a need to repay. So if you receive help from somebody, you're worried about having to do a favor back for them. And it's especially distressing if you're not going to have the opportunity to do so. And so if you feel indebted to somebody, but you'll never be able to repay that debt, knowing that ahead of time might make you resist or, or, or hesitate helping them. Sometimes help implies that the helpie is inferior to the helper. We all are worried to some degree or another about our social status, and we worry about being seen as inferior to others that might be our peers. And so we might turn down help because we're worried about being less than the helper. Uh, sometimes we refuse help because it relates to a core ability of the person being helped. Like we don't want to be helped because this is a thing we're supposed to be good at. <laughs> And I think many of you have experienced this in settings before where there's something that you're normally really good at and for whatever reason it's not working. Maybe it's a job that you were hired to do and now you're struggling to do the task for whatever reason. The things that we're normally good at or that we feel like should be a core ability create a resistance for us to accept help. And then finally, it may just threaten our overall self-image. We all have a perception of ourselves and this tends to be a perception we like. Certainly that's not true in every instance or in every case, but psychological health comes along with a positive self-image, and it may be that the threat is, it, that the help is threatening our, our positive self-image. And so this threat model is, these different factors or elements or instances of the threat model are good to keep in mind if you want to be a helper. People may refuse your help if it's stepping on any of these five um, sort of landmines. And so be attentive to the, the psychological and self-image well-being of the person that you're trying to help. This is why dignity is such a, an important part of helping. The best kind of helping is the kind that preserves the dignity of the person being helped because it avoids all the problems that we talked about here. Another issue, though, is even if the person receiving help is happy to receive it, sometimes help stops after it starts. It ends prematurely. There are a lot of reasons that help stops. It might be burnout. Uh, it, you just simply have run out of the emotional energy to keep going and helping. Sometimes we're disappointed. We might find that we're helping, but it's not working as well as we thought. Uh, it might be resource exhaustion. We've run out of time or money or whatever, it else, whatever else we need to draw upon in order to help somebody else. Sometimes life changes bring a stop to help. A person might move. Uh, somebody might pass away. Um, uh, you might uh, uh, lose your job. All these sorts of life changes can stand and get in the way of our ability to help others. Sometimes it comes out of conflict where the helper and the helpy no longer see eye to eye. And because of the conflict, there's no longer a relationship to be the basis for helping. Sometimes helping stops because of unrealistic expectations. Uh, people started helping based on the thought that this great thing was going to happen because it didn't happen, then uh, the motivation to help stops. And then sometimes the need has changed, meaning that you're really good at helping the person in one need. Circumstances have changed in their life such that now the need is different and you're no longer fit for the purpose. This is not by any means a complete list. Uh, in class, I want us to talk about what the other reasons are that come to mind as to why help stops prematurely. What we know, though, is that help that endures is resilient. And this is an important word. There's a lot of research on resilience in human beings, uh, resilient ecosystems, 
uh, help is, is also something that needs resilience in order to endure. And so the question we ought to dig into is what makes help resilient? The reality is that there's not enough research addressing this question. We've talked about this in class, how there's lots of research on what motivates pro-social behavior. There's lots of research on what, the, what are the benefits of pro-social behavior. But there's not a lot of research on the effectiveness of pro-social behavior, meaning is somebody's help good enough? And one of the ways that help might fail is because helpers quit early or other circumstances prevent them from continuing to help. So I'm going to give you five reasons that I think help stops prematurely or five reasons that help is, well, I'll reframe it. I want to talk about five things that help make help more resilient. One of these is hope. And we've already talked about the idea of hope. This is Dr. Rick Snyder's framework. Hope, if you remember, when an individual has hope, they have particular goals in mind that they're aspiring to. They can see pathways for accomplishing those goals and they have a sense of agency that, that uh, they have the power to accomplish those goals. And so what we know from the research is, first of all, hope is uh, predicts higher resilience at all ages. If people are hopeful, they're more resilient and in all different settings, genders, cultures, and so on. So hope is this fundamental human need that we can see a path to a better future that we're aspiring to. This is true for helpers, too. So if as a helper you lose hope, then your help will become less resilient. The same applies to helpies. Helpies who don't feel hope are going to be harder to help. And so hope should always be constantly cultivated and be assessed by helpers and helpies in the process, and that will make the help more enduring and resilient. Hope also predicts more pro-social behavior. When people are hopeful, they're more likely to engage in pro-social ways. So that's number one is hope. Number two is empowerment. And the idea of empowerment, the word empowerment is really broadly used and, and often means lots of things in lots of contexts. The original scholarly idea of empowerment comes from Dr. Julian Rappaport, who, uh, who did community psychology and social work. And he developed this model of empowerment, which is to work with people focusing on their strengths instead of their deficiencies. The idea being that if in a situation you're trying to help someone, you spend all the time focusing on the ways that they are inadequate for their circumstances, unable to solve their problems, you can perpetuate dependency. Whereas a, a more effective and sustainable way to help somebody is to cultivate their strengths that they have, demonstrate how their strengths and their ability to do things in impressive ways can help them to solve their problems. And so this idea of empowerment has a much more particular meaning than the ways that is broadly used today. And so one of the ways you can be more resilient as a helper and the way your help can be more sustainable is by making people the solutions to their own problems. You do this by focusing on their strengths. Help them learn to cultivate and apply their strengths in ways that make them more capable of solving their own problems, which is the heart of this empowerment approach within social work. All right, so that's number two. Number three is using teams. Teams are an overlooked way to help all the time in informal settings. People are overwhelmed because they simply don't have a team. They don't have a group of people engaged in solving the problem. And, and so they're by themselves and they run into all the issues that we talked about before, burnout, disappointment, resource exhaustion, and so on. And so if you recruit a team to help and engage a larger group of people in the help of the neighbor, the relative, whoever, then you're going to make help more sustainable. Now, there are some ingredients to make teams more effective in helping. First of all, everybody needs a role in the team. So it, sh so it shouldn't be the case that everybody does every job. Sustainable helping teams are the kind where everybody has a job to do that's theirs. And the job that they've been given is a fit to their expertise. And I don't just mean expertise like the lawyer does the law stuff, although that would be true too. What I mean by expertise is the skills that they can bring to the problem that they're trying to solve for the person who's in need. Th these are skills they've been able to hone and develop that make them better suited than somebody else. And it's important that these roles and expectations are clearly agreed upon by everybody in the group. Teams, Helping teams are also more effective if the responsibilities are distributed to reduce burnout. So it's not just that you're doing the task that is fit to your skill. But the task you've been given also shouldn't be 99% of the work. Uh, what, the way this works best is if the different responsibilities are distributed among the team members so everybody has their ability to give within their constraints. 
And then finally, team members have to share identity and successes. You have to engage in a way that everybody is sort of gathering and recognizing the accomplishments of the group as a whole so that the team feels satisfaction, even if they didn't necessarily lead to a particular outcome. I can't go into detail, but I'm part of a helping team now. A friend uh, called me some years back to help with a brother of his, and he was looking for one person to fill a certain role. And instead, we talked about, well, what if we created a team for this person? And I, I'm happy to say that now, three years in, the team has made an incredible change in this person's life, and it's really cool to see. But it took a deliberate team-based strategy to get us get to, to get that situation to where it is. Okay. Uh, so that was number three. Number four is using systems and culture. Anytime you can embed helping into a standard practice, whether it's a systematic practice like in a workplace or a community, but, or maybe it's a cultural practice in a community, anytime you can embed helping behavior systematically or culturally, it's going to be more sustainable. So three examples of that. Whenever you go get a new driver's license, you're asked if you want to be an organ donor. And this is a really easy, systematic way to get more people recruited into organ donations that, heaven forbid, should something happen to them, they get in an accident and pass away. Now, all of a sudden, they're a donor that's available to help other people in need where it might not otherwise happen. This is a really simple, systematic way to increase organ donations. Among Latter-day Saints, fast Sundays and fast offerings are a great example of both cultural and systematic improvements to, to, to make helping more sustainable. Once a month, Latter-day Saints will, will refrain from eating for, for two meals. They'll take, at a minimum, the value of those two meals, and they'll donate them to the fast offering, to the church welfare program. This is called their fast offering. And fast offerings fund many millions of dollars of, of, of community support for people in need. And the systematic part of that happens also in the fact that you have bishops and Relief Society presidents who are acting, who, who are carrying out the service that's made available with these resources. And so this is a great example of a systemic and cultural combination. And then another thing that's an example of, of systems and culture is workplaces will have a, a donation option for paid time off. So if a fellow employee is, is, is suffering from uh, some sort of health setback or they have a loved one who is. Some volunteers can donate paid time off to, so, sorry, some employees can donate paid time off to other employees. And and so where there's not paid time off available to the employee um, who's in need, other employees might be able to make the, that donation of paid time off. All of these are examples of ways that create more systemic and sustainable ways to help. And then lastly, economic incentives can be incredibly powerful. We can incentivize helping with, for non-compassionate reasons. There are a lot of ways that helping happens simply because of financial motives. You know, like if you call a help support line for a company where you need help, that person on the other, other end of the phone is being paid. But they may be an incredible support rep, right? They may be going above and beyond to help you. And, but they're also there because they're being paid to be, to be there. That's a really simple example. But if you want to look for more sophisticated ways of thinking how you can use economic incentives to extend helping to a larger group of people, I recommend the book The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid by uh, Michigan business professor C.K. Prahalad. Dr. Prahalad had this uh, really cool model of basically showing that business can be done efficiently and profitably serving the poorest of the poor. And his book, his book sort of lays out the model of how this works and then also gives a mountain of case study examples of where this is true. What happens is when you implement economic incentives uh, where doing business can be profitable and improve people's lives, it creates a new equilibrium for those in need. And you see this in, in, the, in the social entrepreneurship space as well. Anytime somebody's engaging in some new business that improves the world, uh, you're seeing economic incentives uh, being used to create helping. So what are the threats to resilient help? What are the sort of things that stand in the way of help truly being resilient? Well, it's all the things we've already talked about, the reasons that help stop, burnout, disappointment, resource exhaustion, and so on. And so these are the sorts of things that combat the, the, the five sustainability or, or um, resilience factors that I already mentioned. And so you lean into the resilience uh, strategies in order to combat these things. But also another issue that we need to consider is that sometimes problems are so large and complex that uh, they become wicked problems. And wicked problems are more likely to defy and also to bring an end to helping efforts. And so wicked problems require all five of those things we talked about, 
but amplified, right? You need to have lots of hope. You need to have lots of economic incentives, lots of systematic and cultural improvements, um, lots of empowerment going on, right? All of these factors, these five factors of resilient health that we talked about, when it comes to complex, wicked problems, you have to have an extra measure of all of those things. It's worth noting, though, that helping benefits helpers, adding to resiliency. We talked about how there's lots of research on how pro-social behavior benefits the people who engage in pro-social behavior. Well, these benefits can induce greater resiliency in helpers. Helping others, for example, tends to improve physical and mental health. And so if you're a helper, you're more likely as a result of your helping to have better physical and mental health than you would have otherwise. Obviously, better health is going to improve your resiliency as a helper. Uh, it also produces other beneficial effects in helpers, like gratitude, social connections, feelings of purpose. Helpers enjoy a greater measure of all of these things as a result of helping. It just so happens that gratitude, social connection, feelings of purpose also create more resilient help. And then finally, helping encourages more helping by contagion. Uh, if, if nobody's helping in a situation, it actually reduces the likelihood that anybody will help. Whereas if one person steps in to help, it increases the likelihood that there will be additional helpers. And there's lots of research in lots of different settings to show how helping behavior is contagious. Because once one person shows the way, other people know to follow and, and be similarly helpful. And so this is another way that helping can, can make itself, in turn, recursively more helpful. Because, it, uh, because the helping becomes contagious and recruits more helpers. So uh, this video is shorter, which I guess is making up for the fact that my other videos are longer. In class, we're going to talk through three examples of resilient help. We're going to talk about parenting as a cultural factor and talk about how parenting persists over time uh, and the ways that we can make it more or less resilient, but how it's a fundamental mode of human helping. Uh, we're also going to talk about Wikipedia. Why does Wikipedia persist when everybody who contributes, with the exception of a handful of paid employees, Everybody who's contributing to Wikipedia is doing it out of a pro-social motive, out of a, a desire to help others, is the primary reason people contribute to or edit Wikipedia. And the question is, why is that so sustainable over time? And then last, we're going to talk about something called Nerdfighteria. If you haven't heard of this, this is a, a collection of people who, uh, who act in concert to support work being led, although not entirely done by, but work led by the Green brothers, Hank Green and John Green. Hank Green is a great science explainer, successful businessman. Uh, John Green is a, is, a, is a very successful author across both young adult and nonfiction titles. Uh, a lot of his books have been made into movies. We're going to talk about this nerd fighteria movement that they've started and talk about how it's endured all kinds of hard things over the years, like, like recurring health problems for the Green Brothers, uh, most recently uh, Hank Green uh, being treated for cancer. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the way it's uh, pivoted over time to solve new and even bigger problems. It's a really cool case example of resilient help over time, and I look forward to talking about it with you in class. See you all then.